I find one of the trickier things to do is to mask off a straight water line, um, uh, especially if you've lost the original water line because either you've painted the boat many times um, or you've raised the water line several times because the boat's floating lower and lower in the water as you add more and more of your stuff on board. Um, and I fall into both of those categories. Uh, so the general technique here is to unroll several meters of tape at a time and then just sight it uh, as I'm doing right now and uh, and then at first just lightly pat it down uh, once you think you've got it straight and then uh, and then I'll, I'll walk back in a minute and just take a look at it and see if it looks right and then once you think you uh, have it where you want it it looks reasonably straight uh, then go around and push firmly down on the tape uh, so that the paint doesn't seep underneath and you get a nice nice crisp straight water line. I'm using anti-fouling paint on uh, for the boot top here. I'm using Pettit on epoxy which is a hard anti-foul. I used to use topside paint for the boot top but I found uh, uh, there was two problems with that. One is because uh, the boat is generally floating right at the top of the anti-foul, um, I would start getting growth on the boot top. Um, and the other thing is uh, because the boot top was being wetted so frequently, uh, I found the top side paint would just blister up and begin to peel off uh, even after just one year. And I'm going to remove the tape immediately after painting. I just put two coats on. Uh, the main reason for that is I don't want to leave the tape on too long, uh, otherwise it might pull my fresh topside paint off. Uh, that's always a danger there. Uh, but I made it around pretty well this time without pulling up any, uh, any of the black paint on the top sides. So now we're back to the bottom. Remember we cut open those blisters in places where the water had gotten underneath the barrier coat. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just put straight epoxy in, in all of those blisters. Um, so just, just completely wet it out uh, with straight epoxy. Then what I'm going to do is uh, after a few hours, once the, once the epoxy's had a chance to set up but not completely cure, um, I'm going to go around again um, adding epoxy with the 407 um, filler additive which makes it into a fairing compound uh, so I can sand it smooth and uh, right there I just accidentally dumped a whole bunch of 407 in the epoxy and uh, so we're getting that sorted out so then once we put the epoxy with the fairing compound uh, we're going to give it a full overnight cure and come back the next day and start sanding the fairing compound smooth. So that's what I'm doing right here. And uh, I'm wet sanding again with 80 grit sandpaper. Um, I think actually I'm using 50 grit right now just to, to, uh, to uh, cut it back a little faster. And once I'm done with fairing all the blisters, then I'm going to give the entire bottom another uh, thorough wet sanding uh, with 80 grit sandpaper, uh, just to get it uh, just to get it nice and smooth um, and ready for a for the first coat of anti-fouling paint. So I'm going to switch anti-fouling paints again this year. Um, previously I had used Pettit Ultima 60, um, which is a pretty expensive paint, about uh, $230 a gallon. And I just put two coats on. And uh, But I found it began to fail uh, this past year when I got to Miami. I began getting barnacles. Um, and then it really began to fail on the bay over the summer. Um, so I'm going to try the Blue Water Copper Shield 45, uh, which is also an ablative paint, but only about $110 a gallon. And I'm going to put three coats on. 
Um, and as you see, this is the first coat I'm going to put on, and I'm going to put on a, um, uh, the first coat will be black in color, and then the next two coats will be red. Uh, so that way I can monitor how quickly the paint is wearing away and see uh, perhaps if the problem is, is I just didn't put enough paint on. So now we're finishing up with the final coat, the third coat of red paint. Um, and for this boat, generally it's about a gallon of coat. And um, as, as you get, uh, usually the first coat, uh, that, that soaks up a lot of paint. And then uh, the next two, um, usually I'll have a little bit left over. And so I'll, I'll put some extra paint around the waterline and right up in the bow, uh, in places where it tends to wear away. I also had the yard move the jack stands around between the second and third coat uh, so I could paint under where the jack stands were. And then um, just when they lift her up in the slings, just before launching, I'll slap some paint on um, right where the keel blocks were. Um, and there's, there's really nothing else you can do about those. And so now we're taking the tape off and uh, she's beginning to look pretty sharp. So, of course, we got to put the name and the hail back on, uh, make everything official here. And uh, this is a little trickier than uh, putting this decal on. It's a little trickier than with the uh, dinghy uh, because the hull is so curved, uh, especially with a double ender like Ruth Avery there. Uh, you have a, um, quite a curvy surface to deal with. And so, uh, if you remember, we made a long tape hinge. Uh, for the decal and then we'll just swing it down on that hinge but uh, that's a little more difficult when you're dealing with a curved surface so you have to be careful that you don't get creases in, in the paper backing there uh, which will mess your lettering up So we're getting down to the end now. Uh, time to put the trim tab to the self-steering wind vane back on. Uh, as you can see, there's three gudgeons, two gudgeons on the rudder. And the bottommost gudgeon is just a closed hole that the shaft goes through. And I have a couple of washers there. And uh, so I'll put that in first and then just, uh, just tie it off, tie the trim tab off to the rudder uh, so I can go up top. And, uh, and put the top gudgeon on, which will just screw on to a little shelf uh, at the top of the rudder head. So that's what I'm doing right there. And the final piece of the puzzle, as you can see, the top gudgeon is open. And then there's just a little plate that bolts on. Uh, to the top of that gudgeon, which will close it, uh, will uh, and so hold hold the uh, hold the shaft in place there. So and then those are just two uh, small brass machine screws that go through there. This was an unintended design feature of the trim tab. Uh, as you can see, I can just move it up to it bumps up against the top gudgeon, and it will not pop out of the bottom gudgeon. Um, and then I can just apply some grease to the shaft um, so, so uh, to, to minimize friction so it will work well in light airs. Um, I used to put a cotter pin in the bottom so that the trim tab would not ride up uh, when it's when I'm sailing, but I found that would never happen. So uh, now I just leave the cotter pin out, and that way I can also grease the shaft uh, even when the boat's in the water, uh, just with my mask and snorkel. And so finally, after nearly six weeks on the hard, she is ready to go back in the water.
Thanks. Enjoy your winter. And the travel.